Hello and welcome. Yes, it is a new season, a new beginning of Inside the Borough, the FAU podcast for and by Owls fans. Shane is here. Your boy Jack is here. Uh, we survived the dreaded bowl game doldrums and watching FAU not be in a college football playoff. Shame. Shame we didn't make the top four, I got to tell you. But it is what it is, and it is a new day, a new season is uh, uh, around, a new season is upon us, and with that, it's going to come some major changes. I mean, we, we saw that today, Shane, we're recording this on, on Thursday now, and we got some pretty big news on the defensive coordinator front. First off, earlier this week, Jim Levitt heading off to uh, Southern Methodist, the team that FAU beat in the Boca Bowl a couple of years ago, beat, I mean, destroyed without hardly any of their best players. Uh, so best of luck to, to Mike. He, he led an amazing defense down here in Boca. But what a freaking name we got lined up in paradise. Mike Stoops, are you serious? Defensive coordinator at Oklahoma for, dude, how long? Like 10 years in total? I think it was split up four years. Yeah, two stints. Two stints, thank you. So four years. Then he was the uh, he head coach at University of Arizona. For seven years and came back to OU, back to Norman to be the defensive coordinator there before, before he was going, uh, he was an analyst at Coaching Rehab University, also known as the University of Alabama. Nick Saban, as, as we know, as Florida Atlantic fans and with Lane Kiffin, we know how great he is at rehabbing coaches. He was there for two years as an analyst. Shane, I mean, I was shocked when I saw this news earlier today. What was your take on it? Uh, I wasn't shocked. I, I, I had a feeling they were going to kind of go after kind of a nice name, right? Uh, or someone that had a ton of experience to replace that. You know, um, from what I understand, and I'm sure the numbers will come out, that, you know, SMU, just, you know, to speak out loud a bit, is in a position – to kind of be a top G five team this year. They returned a lot of that team back that we beat, you know, they, they were good last year. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm sure good old, old SMU money, uh, you know, probably gave Levitt a nice little pay grade, but, you know, here's the thing, coordinators and assistants, you can't expect them to stick around. There's no such thing as career assistants or anyway, this is FAU's sixth defensive coordinator in as many years. Right. So we've done this before, okay? This is no big deal. Uh, but they hired a guy with tons of experience, head coaching experience, was a head coach at Arizona for eight years, I believe, went to three bowl games. Uh, obviously, you know, his brothers, uh, you know, are successful head coaches. Uh, and yeah, like you said, I, 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 don't, I call it the Saban car wash, right? Like, you know, you go through Kiffin, Butch Jones, uh, you know, numerous assistants, half that staff has been hired away. Um, I, you know, anyone that kind of, yeah. yeah uh, you know, he, Charles Huff was a little different situation, but Marshall's head coach was just the running back coach there. Okay. So you get someone with tons of experience, right. Uh, kind of from a scheme perspective, he runs a very similar scheme, kind of that multiple three, four. Okay. Most defensive coordinators are just going to tell you they're multiple these days. Everyone has to be multiple, but you know, it's not like they're going to – Chris Jones isn't going to be lining up in a three-point stance next year, right? You're going to see a lot of the kind of the same formations and stuff. And these to the uh, the average football fan's eyes. Uh, you know, the, the only thing was there was a little bit of a struggle with him at the end of Oklahoma, you know, those defenses. Now, some people were – I already saw a couple of things on the message board. Yeah, oh, they were, they were bad. Tons of star recruits. You know, uh, and I was talking about this with someone a few weeks ago, uh, who works in psychology football. Defense is really hard nowadays. Uh, even Nick Saban kind of mentioned that, you know, we saw even Nick Saban's defense last year or in the past couple of years give up over 40 points a few times, right? It's just team score nowadays. And, you know, I, I think those Oklahoma defenses just talent wise weren't up with with a lot of the big 12 kind of air raid offenses uh and, and for those that are worried go look at we love glove spencer here right his defenses weren't in the top 10 when he was at oklahoma state right but what he did was take a situation where 
in the Big 12, all you ask is your defense to be average, right? Like, <laughs> you'd stop someone once, twice a game, yeah, right? Yeah, and you're good. That's and, the big yeah, you know, I remember when we hired Glenn Spencer, I was like, oh, okay. You know, he made it 10 years as a defensive coordinator in the Big 12. So, you know, if you could shut down and see all those offenses for years, I, you know, uh, uh, FIU shouldn't be an issue. So, uh, in plus, you know, I want to know if this – you know, as we've got a message on the message board, we have tons of seniors returning. So there's not going to be a huge transition. Zion Gilbert, this is his fifth season. And he's been through five defensive coordinators. What is this? Jordan Helm, you know, veteran guys. There's not going to be this huge learning curve with him. So I, I'm, I'm not really concerned at all. I think uh, the, the, the defense will just march on. It reminds me a lot of um, – I mean, we're going to go back for a little bit. When Arkansas State had, like, four different head coaches in four different years. You remember that? I forgot when that – like, 2013 to 2017 or something ridiculous like that? On the, that time? Yeah, before. Gus Melson was one of them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd have to – The guy that like just – I think was the last one. Utah. Utah State. He yeah. Was, he was the last one, and now here they are again. So, I mean, mm -hmm. would, would you rather have six defensive coordinators – Every year, you know, with every year, or do you want four new head coaches? Obviously, you'd pick. App State's had, I believe, three head coaches in three years. Yeah. I think this was their third head coach, and they were, they won 10. I think they had another great season, went to a bowl game, dominated. So, yeah, you, you kind of want your program just to kind of, in, in regular years, um, obviously not COVID years where there's kind of outside factors, just to kind of march on. And I, I think, Stoops will be fine with that hire. No souls to remember, as of right now, Raymond Woody still here. Experience, been a defensive coordinator before. Kevin Patrick, still one of the best defensive line coaches in the country, still here. So, and and, and like you said, you kind of want your team to, to move on. We you mentioned this earlier. We have the veteran leadership on the defensive side of the ball to definitely do that. So it'll definitely be an exciting time. Uh, definitely a big splash. It shows that we're legit. Marshall's been getting a lot of hype with. Uh, you know, their head coach seeing uh, the decision that they made with Coach Huff from Alabama, and then we'll talk about it later with poaching some of FAU staff, and then we just kind of punch right back with this massive uh, hire that has gotten national attention. Uh, but let's move up to the offensive side of the ball real quick because this happened, you know, a wee bit ago, but Mike Johnson has been named the co-offensive coordinator slash QB coach. He was with Coach Taggart at Oregon, and as Shane uh, alluded before we were recording, just oozes with NFL experience. I mean, can you can you name a, a coach or a, sorry, a, a famous quarterback that he used to coach back in the NFL ranks? Maybe a name that someone might know. Yeah, M Michael Vick. You know, he was there during those days. Oh, that um, guy. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a big name. Yeah. It, the 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 like the OG of what when you see all these quarterbacks running around today in the NFL, the Lamar Jacksons and yep. all those, you know, uh, for any of our younger listens, Michael Vick pretty much started that, right? Like he was yeah. 20 years ahead of his time. Uh, is, is yeah. The guy has tons of NFL experience. And I remember when we talked about when kind of the FAU moved on from coach Trickett, who did well here, you know, I mentioned that I believe there was no one on the offensive staff that was like over 40. Right. And I don't even think over 35. So they were really young. So I think that that was a move to get experience in here. And yeah, his son is on the team. Right. I don't mind that. <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, we watch the stock stills kill us for four years. Right. <laughs> if it's anything like the stock still. <laughs> yeah. Kills, uh, I'm fine with it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he just, again, oozes with NFL experience. Now you mentioned it, uh, Stockstill, the one that was a grad assistant with us that uh, that one year was it one or two years under Lane. Uh, he's one now, year. So he's he's back with his with his father uh, at Middle Tennessee. That was just announced a couple weeks ago. So congratulations, he's the receivers coach, correct? I, it's something of the sort. Yeah, that's that's, yes. that's awesome. He's gonna do great there. Um, something an analogy uh, that I've I've been saying for so long now, especially that as we've seen Lamar Jackson. Uh, local South Florida kid really just blow up and become a superstar. Mike Vick walked so Lamar Jackson could run, literally. And and now you see Jackson breaking all of Vick's records. But it's 
he definitely revolutionized the game. And, and if you ask kids that were growing up first playing ball um, at the Pee Wee level, which player they idolized the most, they're most likely going to say Mike Vick. Mike Vick, Derek Brooks. I'm just trying to think of what Florida kids liked. Uh, Deion Sanders comes to mind right away as well. Um, just utilizing their athleticism and knowing that Mike has helped that revolution uh, that can maybe help Posey grow into the quarterback that we all know that he could become. So that being said, we've talked about coaches. Something else big happened this week, Shane. Uh, the schedule was released on Wednesday, midday Wednesday. So we finally have our schedule planned out. We knew our four non-conference games, uh, UF, Georgia Southern, Air Force, and Fordham. Uh, we knew, obviously, our East Division teams, everyone in the East that we played this year. Old Dominion looks like they'll be back. Uh, they took the year off. It took a little sabbatical because of the pandemic. Uh, and then we found out our West opponents. Uh, UTEP, who we haven't played in some time. That's going to be a home game. That's great. Saves us a very long road trip. And then something that I'm over the mood, moon about, we're going to be talking about in a second, defending Conference USA champions, Alabama, Birmingham, UAB. That's going to be a road game up in Birmingham. So, Shane. What, one thing that's – Jack, I started to interrupt. One thing that's interesting yeah. about that UAB game, depending on the timing, Eric Henry mentioned this on the Shulabo podcast, we could be opening their new stadium Ooh. depending on – yeah, so depending – right now that there's like a couple of games circled of I don't know when their their exact schedule, but I guess it's between like us and another game, depending on when they finish our schedule. Like remember FAU opened its stadium October 20th. So it yeah. wouldn't be uncommon for them to like play a few row games. So well, yeah. that would make that game extra tough. I'm sure they'll be sold out 30, 35,000, I believe was that stadium hold. So yeah. definitely in a different dynamic. It's looking like a beautiful stadium there in Birmingham. And we're, we're going to touch on that a little bit because Shane, I, I want to ask you, you know, g give me a couple or try to limit to one, if you can pros and cons that you see with the 2021 FAU schedule. All right. Well, let's start with the cons first. Uh, I joked about this on the other, I, the, uh, the ghost of Pat Chun continues <laughs> around the program. FAU hope <laughs> Two triple option teams, first four weeks. Uh, we just need to throw I, in a Mac game in there on the road. It's yeah. Put a dick um, all Illinois and play NIU, and, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and you know, George, FAU did a good job last year. Contain, we, you know, we didn't lose to Georgia Southern last year because we couldn't stop the triple option. It's, you know, our offense couldn't convert in the red zone every time we drive the ball 60 yards and then miss a field goal or fumble the ball, right? That, right. I, I think back to that Georgia Southern game last year and say, God, we had so many chances to win that game. Right. And remember one of their touchdowns was on a punt. Uh, and then obviously I think I've mentioned this game a few times on the podcast, air force, a bunch of Florida kids playing a mile above sea level, yep. triple option service Academy, like air force has some sort of ridiculous home record over the last like four years. It's like 40 and three or something like that. So, I mean, that game is just, a challenge it reminds uh, me of the wyoming game a few years back yeah <laughs> yeah let's not talk about yeah, that, that one triggering. That's triggering oh boy oh they, they have to this is me no well, I don't care no that, i don't care that quest fumbled they have to go 93 yards in a minute with no timeouts 95 yard play yard play later all right so enough about that my oh, pro my <laughs> pro uh, yeah give us the pro man the pro of a schedule is every conference FAU has won. Every every time FAU's won a conference is coming an odd year. I I do think coincidence not so much. Well, uh, I do think it's nice to have Marshall at home. Yeah. FIU at home. Middle Tennessee at home. Yeah. Places where our record overall, I, FIU we've played well at. I mean that's just, they've been such a dumpster fire, but. You know, not having to go to Huntington, not having to go to Murfreesboro is always a plus for FAU. And our toughest road game, uh, West Kentucky, you know, uh, 
We do it's, great up there. We played well there. It's it's only an hour. It's only like an hour and a half away from Murfreesboro. Like I, I can't figure out one the yeah. other. Or it's a hundred miles. It's the rivalry. It's called a hundred miles of hate. But like, yeah, you know, we've played well in Western Kentucky. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's just I like how getting those two teams at home. I think bodes well for our conference USA. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, when it, that should be the goal always should be winning the conference. Uh, and since so this schedule does set up lightly, you got to think of our biggest opponents in the East traditionally over the last five years, Marshall, Western middle, we get two of those at home. And one of them, we have like the best road record at I probably in program history. If you're playing more than like four games. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, without looking it up, I, I believe we have a winning record at West Kentucky. So it's nuts, especially considering how, how good of a program they were just a few years back. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, my pros and cons, I'm going to start with the con as well. Uh, two cold weather games. That, that really sucks. Uh, we're playing at Norfolk against ODU. And then uh, it's at Western Kentucky. So we have Western Kentucky later on in the year, second to last regular season game before we host Middle Tennessee and Shane and I were talking about hosting Middle Tennessee on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving weekend. That sucks. Like, like we'd much rather just be a road game. That way, there can be some sort of atmosphere because there's there's no drive. Well, it's any G five program. Yeah, that, that gets a home game gets hurt on attendance that weekend. So it's brutal. Um, something I like, and this is tentative because things are subject to change. All the games are on Saturday. That will change. <laughs> yeah, for once. And again, once TV gets involved, that could change. But as of now, things are on a Saturday. Um, I like that as a fan because that means I, you know, get to spend the whole day watching football and then watch my team. Uh, as a reporter that also has another job, it means that I already have the day off. I can work my other jobs and be okay financially and still cover the game. Uh, and then just as someone that's dealt with FAU this past year we got to remember we played Southern Miss on what a Thursday a short week and we played our, our probably our worst game we did we played all, all year uh, at that Southern Miss game so uh, even in the defense struggled then and that that was that was a short week so I don't want to see a short week like that for a long time so once I saw all the Saturdays on there I I was quite happy you know what I also want to mention with about the road thing I realized Charlotte, yeah. we're undefeated on the road at Charlotte. Never, never lost there. So this year, this another... year was the first year. Remember, we talked about this in the pod for it. This was the very first year, the 2020 game, where the home team won. So yeah. remember how we're talking about that we might have the best uh, road record. That's going to be Charlotte. Now we think about it, undefeated. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're three or three and zero there. Three and zero, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, what what is the one game? Sticking with the schedule, what is the one game that you've already circled on your calendar? If you had to pick one, man, because there's a lot. There's Oh, uh, is this this is this is obvious. I think you tweeted about it the other day. Let's just be real. There's nine months of or eleven months of talk between FE and Marshall fans on Twitter for that game. I mean that uh, that's gonna come down to the east. I I you know, as a Marshall's our our rival, all right. I, I don't care what their fans say about who used to be the rival 70 years ago or you know, most Marshall fans live years ago. Uh, is, you know, now you have multiple connections on the staff. Clint Trickett's there. Lance Gidry's there. Uh, Telly Lockett, who was an assistant coach uh, with Willie Taggart at Florida State. So there's a lot of familiarity, right? Uh, Marshall's, one thing they was kind of going downhill at the end of Doc Holliday was the recruiting. That staff was built to recruit. So yeah. That's that. That game is huge. That's a game where you need to clear your schedule now. Send out letters to people saying, "Don't invite me to your wedding or your gender reveal that weekend." That way, you're you're out ahead of it. Okay. Uh, you mean you that know, you you would have friends that would schedule a fall wedding? Yeah, exactly. No, unfriend. So you're not. You know, that's, that's, you know, buy extra tickets for that game. I, that's a game that FAU should, you know, fans should embrace. Should that's embrace. A huge and, game. And, and Shane, I want to give you credit because you mentioned this before you came on. Uh, that happens late in the season this year. In late October, even early November. I, I don't have it in front of me, so forgive me, guys. But it is late in the year. 
It is quite the gauntlet because I think it's Marshall, Old Dominion, um, Western Kentucky, Middle Tennessee. So, I mean, Old Dominion, we'll see how they are. But it's it's a tough stretch. And the winner, winner of that Marshall FAU game down in Paradise could very well win the East. So we're, we're going to need the fans to make sure that you guys have that game circled on your calendar for sure. So we're going to need a home field advantage. For myself, um, the first one that really pops out to me is going to be UF. I mean, that's obvious. The way how the game the, – oh, God, I'm, I'm just – I get so triggered. The way how the UF game ended several years back with the uh, Jensen Stoshak defensive pass interference call that was never called, even though it was plain as day in the rain. I mean, that just hurt so much. I would love payback. UF, UF is looking pretty good. We're, you know, still trying to build some pieces, but I'm excited to see how our defense will do against our offense. Um, and Gainesville is always a good time. Uh, but that being said, I'm actually going to pick at UAB. Defending conference champions. Listen, we, we split the last, what is it, the last, um, is it four championships, right? Between UAB and, uh, so yeah yeah, so we won every odd year they've won every even year at uab especially if they do open up that stadium that's going to be great it's drivable at least for me here in tampa Um, other fans in central florida could drive to it fans in south florida can fly it's definitely the closest when it comes to all the teams uh in the west division it might even be the closest non-fiu conference opponent now i think about it to FAU because if it's not at Charlotte and that's that's a schlep uh Georgia Southern comes to mind home opener great program the Shula Bowl comes to mind but like you said they're a dumpster fire but I I'm gonna pick I'm circling it right now literally on my schedule UAB um defending champions listen if we do well in that game early in the year you have to like our chances throughout the remainder of the season that being said remainder of the season we're going to need some new players coming up for next season. Uh, spring signing day used to be the main signing day, right? Uh, now, I definitely feel like it took a secondary role. Signing day is coming up next week. So, Shane, as the FAU Owls Nest recruiting insider, why don't you give Owl Nation um, some hints to be looking for? So, you know, something they should be uh, excited about. Yeah, it shouldn't be too dramatic of a day. Uh, I know like, yeah, it's the way the recruiting calendar is kind of set up now, you know, obviously early signing period, FAU signed, uh, you know, eight, what, what, the 16 that day, there's a couple more trance, you know, then you include the transfers. So there's really only a few spots for the 2021 class left. I don't want to give out the exact numbers, uh, but, you know, expect a few more of the high school kids to sign. Um, I'll, you know, I'll put out there's a couple other kids who are currently listed on the, you know, the 247 commit list who are, you know, obviously, and the nest has already pointed out, are not going to be part of the class. Uh, okay. Also, I think there's just a couple big rule changes I want to talk to you guys about. First, there's a new rule where you, a player at a high school at JUCO, it used to be they had this, the signing period only started on that first Wednesday in February and they had till like April 1st to sign. That was your signing period, right? Now it goes all the way to August 1st. Wow. What's the difference between August 1st? Well, a Juco player uh, gets their grades May 1st. A high school player gets their grades June 1st, right? So you can wait on kids to see if they pass that last class or have the GPA. That way you're not kind of forced to sign them and then find out a month later, oh, you wasted a spot. Because once they sign, they count, even if they never set foot on campus and you can't waste. Also, if you do wait on a kid, and let's say hypothetically that kid doesn't uh, make it. Now you're in June. Okay, we have a couple spots left. There's 22, there's like 2,000 kids in the portal. Yeah. You go to the portal, say, okay, well, player A and player a, B just didn't pass that class we needed to. We were gonna, we were holding the last scholarship form for the 2021 class. Now you have options in the portal. So, yep. you know, February 3rd kind of, I guess, quote unquote, starts. Um, what's, for, you know, just the finishing touches on FAU's class, which at this point, the 2021 class, only has a few spots left. Yeah. 
Do you think that the program might utilize the portal at all to hit some of those spots? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's going to be a couple of impact portal players between now and the start of the season. Okay. I'm not <laughs> – I mean, I think it's obvious. Right. Uh, I, I don't think there's a G5 team out there. And I think, you know, guys, you're seeing trends with the rosters turnover. And I don't know if we mentioned this. Texas State came out and said they're going to sign 25 transfers. So they're the new Troy now, from the looks of yeah. Well, well, Troy would just oversign. But no, dude, you know, if you're a team, let's say in our conference like Middle Tennessee, well, Middle Tennessee only signed like three players at the early signing period. What do you think they're waiting for? Stocksville's on the hot seat. You know, they're not signing twenty freshmen that are going to help their program two, two, three years from now. Yeah. Right. Uh, so they're going to go and you're going to see, you know, them add a few more and then throughout the summer names are going to pop up. Lesser Kentucky, they've had a ton of transfers in already. Yeah. Um, that quarterback. The, looks the, good, the, we'll see. I'm more skeptical on an FCS quarterback. That's Eric and fair. I debated that on the Sheila Bowl podcast, but they've also had Gage Walker trance out their best offensive lineman, six different DBs on their rosters. Their second leading receiver, uh, a couple linebackers. So, and like I said, you can only take 25. Yeah. That's it. Doesn't matter how many kids transfer out. You can only take 25. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see, especially how G5 programs kind of handle this. Also, you know, I just want to point out hats off to FAU for this January. I believe there was a total of 12 players that freshmen that got here in January and transfers. Awesome. That's something FAU's never had before this many mid years. One, that's a good use of the gray shirt. Okay. Which, you know, Jaden Wheeler, uh, Kobe Stewart, and Peter Work Jr. are all kids from last year's class that gray shirted, waited, didn't use a year of eligibility just to enroll in January. Right. They didn't use a year coming here being backups. Right. It's smart. They weren't to use. Yeah. Yep. So now they're here. They're a year older. They're more developed. And they have nine months to be freshmen before playing a game. Okay. Also, you know, you get guys like Jamal and Dream here early and, you know, uh, a couple other of the young freshmen. So they'll have much more of a chance of making an impact early. Yeah. And, and last question I want to pose to you, and I have my own take on this as well. So I want to see if we align. Do you think kids not being able to travel right now, not being able to make visits, official visits or unofficial, you think that helps a program like FAU? It's, it's, uh, it's a weird one, right? Because you, we have our location. Uh, so obviously we have a lot of kids that already know, uh, you know much about us, a lot of talented kids in the South Florida area. But we think that our facilities now can compete at a really high level. Uh, I think it helps us. A I think it helps coaching staff that are prepared. I think the fact that we had all these commitments in the summer and worked from a point where we had more commitments and didn't wait to add kids at the last minute, got kids in the boat early, Yeah, uh, helped us with this class. Okay. All right. I, I think it's more about your strategy than just, well, can we get them on campus or not? I think it's how your team, if, if your staff is prepared for those realities and comes up with a strategy, which they, this staff was, they'll work out successfully and it's going to work out successfully for us. It's, it sounds like something like another, <laughs> the flip side of the coin, you see what FIU has done and recruiting hasn't gone over too great with them either. Uh, and you see what is their strategy. At least Middle Tennessee has a strategy. You know, Stock still knows that he needs to win now. I mean, even though with the buyout that Middle Tennessee agreed to, I mean, I don't want to call it incompetent, but I don't – it doesn't make any sense to me. So, But at the end of the day, he knows it's hot, and he knows he wants to win now. So he's going to hit the portal. FIU, what, what is their strategy? We, we don't know. So another reason why life is better in paradise my friends. That being said, um, first, first episode of, uh, is this the first episode of the new year? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna repeat that. All right. So well, real quick before you repeat it, where sure. are we at time wise? Uh, we're almost at 30. So. Okay. Yeah. Let's just like cut yeah, right. end this quick. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to do, you know, you meet us on yeah. you know, all this stuff. All right. So, Oh, I'm going to go down here. One, two, three. Okay, so first episode of the year in the books. First episode of the new season, just Shane and myself. 
Dan, we miss you, brother. Hope things are going well. Our nation, we hope you guys are staying safe amidst this uh, pandemic we got going on. Uh, we know, for example, the basketball team just had a, uh, or the program itself just had a slight outbreak, I guess, if you will. So there will be no series at Marshall this weekend, which sucks because I just love beating Marshall and the team is finally playing really well. Um, but that's going to wrap up this episode. As always, guys, you know, we're on Twitter inside the borough, you know, to always follow F.E. Wow's Nest on social media where we're always breaking some news. Make sure you follow us on the website. Uh, the podcast will remain on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Google Play, and of course on YouTube. Uh, just so you guys know, the pods always go on YouTube before they go anywhere else. So if you want that, if you want that first, be one of the first ones in our nation to hear what Shane and I are, are complaining about this week. Uh, that's definitely the place to do it. So, that being said, from Shane, myself. Thanks for joining us, guys. Go Owls. Marshall sucks. Rick.